My name is Daniel. I'm a postdoc at MIT. And uh, I'm going to show you some work that is in press right now at PNAS. And so if you're really into this and want to know more about it, you can ask me about it after the talk or find it online in a couple of weeks on the archive or my web page. OK. And so to begin with, you can ignore that title slide. We'd learned this morning a lot about um, planetary climate. And the way most of us tend to think about it is that a planet's climate is a balance between incoming radiation from a star and outgoing infrared radiation from the planet itself. So the outgoing long wave radiation OLR. For that balance to actually be useful to tell us something about a planet's climate, we have to relate it to something that we care about, like temperature. And so the other thing that many of us here do is we know that a black body gives off um, en energy as sigma t to the 4. And so we tend to assume that planets like Earth will behave similarly. Um, and so, for example, in radiation classes, that often gets used as a simple model. Now, the question is, what does Earth actually do? And so let's go here. So let me walk you through this plot because this is important. And if you're going to remember anything from this talk, it's this plot. What I did is I took some data sets of Earth's OLR in cloud free regions from a satellite and a data set of its near surface temperature. And so I take the globe, I chop it up into latitude, longitude, and time bins. And then I make this huge 2D histogram over here. And notice that this is, uh, this is how many numbers of observations you have within that bin. It's a log scale, so almost all the observations are within this yellow smear or cloud over here. And so, two things. The first thing is, if you think Earth looks like a black body or proportional to it, you would actually be flat out wrong. That's the main takeaway message of this talk. There's a very good... But the good thing is, there's a really good upshot to that. Actually, we can do better than that. We can just fit a simple linear regression to this blob of data, and we come up with a ridiculously high um, fraction of the variance explained by just a straight line. So Earth is actually not nonlinear, it's linear. This is important for a number of things, just to mention one of them. The feedback, uh, sorry, the slope of this blue line is called Earth's climate feedback. We've heard that before. What it means is if the line is straight, the slope of that line is constant and does not depend on temperature. And so if you warm a part of the tropics up by 5 degrees Kelvin, you get exactly the same boost to the top of that or the same change to the top of atmosphere radiation budget as if you take the poles and warm those up by 5 Kelvin. And so if you want to think about um, paleoclimate, this actually implies that at least on the long wave side of the equation, Earth's climate feedback seems to be roughly independent of temperature and therefore if we knew what it was in the past we could also maybe use it, uh, usefully use it to say something <coughs> about right now okay and what i'm going to be doing about and the second thing is this is really counterintuitive because all the processes that we know that go into determining earth's olr are actually really strongly non-linear so we have a giant complicated system that somehow conjures up to do something that's really simple and linear so why is that and the other thing is, this is actually even more puzzling. We've known about this for roughly 50 years now. If you go back to Budiko in the late 60s, they were the, uh, the first people starting to compile measurements of surface fluxes and satellite measurements, um, they got exactly the same curve out of this. Okay. And so what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is to convince you that this straightness of this line is not a fluke. There's actually a very basic, simple reason behind that. And so next time you go think about radiative transfer, climate modeling, or paleoclimate, you can keep that in mind. So the way I'm going to do that is we're going to go from this complicated system, and I'm going to show you first some 1D radiative convective model calculations of Earth's OLR. And then I'm going to boil that down even more to a single equation. And once we have it to a single equation, I think we've got, uh, we have the physics pretty much nailed. But what, so let's start. What I'm showing you here is um, a line-by-line -line radiation code that I used to compute Earth's OLR, and it's an idealized model of Earth. So what I'm saying is we have one bar of nitrogen or background atmosphere. H2O is the only greenhouse gas in this atmosphere. We keep it fixed at 100% relative humidity, and what we get is this blue curve over here. And so you can see at high temperatures, we go into the runaway greenhouse. We've already heard about that. But over here on the left-hand side, leading up to the runaway greenhouse, it looks essentially flat, not curved like a black body. To quantify that, we can look at the feedback, which again is the slope of OLR with temperature. And you get this blue curve over here. And this purplish bar shows the range over which the feedback 
is essentially constant to within plus minus 10 percent and so you can see for a black body the range over which your feedback is approximately constant is like maybe 10 15 degrees over here you get a whopping 60k or more so something in this nonlinear system is conspiring to give us linearity so this is an emergent behavior of what earth does okay now if you want to dig to understand this we have to dig into what the radiation is actually doing as a function of wave number or frequency so this is a spectrum if you take these curves and you integrate them in wave number you just get back the olr what i'm showing you here is so the top of atmosphere flux spectrally resolved as you go from a surface temperature of 240k all the way up to 320k for reference this red curve in the back is what a black body's emission would look like okay and so what you can see is that olr has to go up with warming and that's good these curves do go up but they only go up in certain regions over here on the left you're essentially fixed even though you change surface temperature by a mass of 80k same thing over here on the right these are actually special regions of the spectrum they're the part of the spectrum where h2o really like to absorb photons this is the h2o rotation band and the first h2o vibration band so all the increase of this that this curve has comes from over here in the middle around a thousand wave number uh, thousand centimeter inverse and that's called the window region of Earth's atmosphere. So that's where photons can escape basically all the way from the surface up to space. So that's going to be really important in a second, but first let me explain why is this uh, irradiance almost constant over such a huge range of climates over here and over here. And there's a very simple physical reason for that. It gets a little bit into radiative transfer, but the short story is the optical thickness at a single, a single frequency is just the integral with respect to height of this guy, kappa. That's how good is the water is water vapor at absorbing radiation at that frequency times Q, which is the amount of water vapor that you have somewhere in the atmosphere. Turns out on Earth, this kappa only varies by a factor of a few between all the way from the surface to um, the tropopause, so really high up. And that's because of things like pressure changes. But only a factor of a few. In contrast, Q changes by orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude or more, and that's because its abundance is determined by the clausius clapeyron relationship, which is really sensitive to temperature. So to first order, you can just pull this guy out of the integral, and you're just left with the total integral of how much water vapor you have inside your column. Meteorologists call this the water vapor path. This function is, es is essentially a fixed function of temperature. Let me show you that here. You can think of this as height. Instead of like geometric height, we use temperature as height though. And what I'm showing you is the water vapor path and all these calculations going from 240K up to 320K. And all these curves collapse onto a near universal profile. What that means is that imagine your atmosphere becomes optically thick at some frequency and you start emitting at a brightness temperature of say something like 250K to space. Once you are starting to emit at 250k to space, you don't really care anymore what the surface does and you decouple from the surface temperature. And your radiation to space is essentially always pinned to this temperature if you're optically thick. And so that explains exactly why over here and over here, the radiation doesn't care about what the surface is doing. The good thing is, you can think of the radiation to space as a chunk that comes from the atmosphere, left and right, and a chunk that comes from the surface. So if we want to understand why Earth's OLR goes up with temperature, we actually only have to think about the surface. And that's the simple model which you can write down as a single equation. So Earth's net climate feedback is just the feedback of a black body, that of the surface, which the derivative of sigma t to the four is four sigma t to the third. And then you have to multiply it with what fraction of the spectrum can that radiation actually escape to space from. And that's simple, so that's shown here on the left which is if you're extremely cold, you have essentially no water vapor in the atmosphere. And so every part of the spectrum, photons can escape to space. And once you become hotter, you start closing off, uh, uh, you start closing off uh, frequencies and the window shrinks and shrinks and shrinks because you're putting more water vapor into the atmosphere until essentially no photons can make it from the surface to space anymore. And what this model is saying is take the feedback of the surface, which is this black line over here, multiply it with this curve. If you want to know exactly why the shape of this curve looks the way it does, ask me afterwards. But if you multiply this black line, which curves upwards, 
And this blue line, which curves downwards, so both are nonlinear, the nonlinearities actually tend to cancel out because what you get here is a big bump in the feedback. So the blue curve is the feedback from a complicated, now a complicated radiation model. The light blue curve is our model, which is just multiplying those two together. And what you can see is because you get this bump here, you will get a region over which feedback is almost always going to be constant over a really wide range of temperatures. And that means that Earth's OLR is going to be linear in temperature over a really wide range of temperatures. Okay, let's see. Oh yeah, so the good part about the story is, is Earth special? No. So we're used to thinking about H2O being the condensable at our distance away from the star. But we've heard lots of great talks this week about further away, beyond the habitable zone, we know CO2, uh, CO2 starts collapsing. And so imagine you have a planet with a CO2 ocean in which, so you ha again have a condensable greenhouse gas, except there it's CO2, not H2O. Closer to the star, things that we might actually be able to study in the next couple of years, we might have lava planets where silicate vapor species could be acting as analogs of H2O on Earth. And it turns out that, so here what I'm showing you is a couple of calculations I did for an Earth-like planet, uh, sort of think of a cold super Mars, so you give it a mass of CO2 ocean at the bottom, and uh, here you can take a planet, which is maybe a thawed Titan, where you need like a soup of ammonia, and then in this ammonia atmosphere and the CO2 atmosphere, you again get massive whopping linear OLR ranges before you go into the runaway. And notice silicate oxides, we actually don't have the data yet, but I this strongly suggests that these planets could actually behave very similar. And that's good news because it means that the lessons that we've learned about radiative transfer and things like climate feedbacks on Earth will actually also help us to study these planets and vice versa. If we study these planets, we can also improve our understanding of how we think about Earth's radiative budget. With that, I'll come to my conclusions. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Time for a couple of questions. The satellite plot at the beginning of OLR versus temperature, was that just clear sky? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I, I hopefully mentioned that. Yes, this is in cloud-free regions. The good news is the story gets a little bit more complicated, but still sort of basically holds if you add clouds. It gets a bit messier because over here at really high temperatures, what you start to see is only the top of a the tops of anvil clouds. So this yellow curve extends to over here and then has a huge smear downwards. But the linearity on this part of the plot is essentially like still holds so true. The, so the linearity and and what would hold for paleoclimate versus today would only be for uh, the long wave portion of the feedback in the clear sky. Yes. Okay. But if you want to talk about the cloudy part of the long wave, you also have to think about the short wave part of the clouds. And that's a problem that nobody has solved yet. So this is like a good first stab of like a zeroth order model of what an Earth-like planet actually does. Hi, uh, my question follows Dorian's. So the clear sky region are usually under-saturated. So how do you reconcile your pure saturated simulation with the under-saturated calculations and how the relative humidity of what vapor varies over this wide range of temperatures. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is that actually, if you have, if you're subsaturated, you help push up the linear range of like the range over which temperature here is roughly linear, you actually help push that up to even higher temperatures, which is a good thing for understanding Earth's present day climate. Um, you can check that out in the paper. And the next thing is assuming relative humidity being roughly constant in temperature or with respect to climate is sort of like a zeroth order assumption. It's like an emergent property that comes out of many GCMs and other models. Nobody understands perfectly why it happens, but it is sort of like a much better working assumption than say fixed humidity. So that's why I think like using fixed relative humidity here is like to the extent that we're doing it here is like not a terrible assumption. 